Hi, <laughs> welcome to Other Minds and Hands. Uh, this is Corey Olson, the Tolkien professor, not joined this week uh, by my co-host Maggie Park, who couldn't be here. I'm on my own this week. Uh, so this week, I'm going to talk about something I'm very enthusiastic about, which is Robert Jordan's The Wheel of Time. Uh, of course, uh, there was just the big adaptation that was recently produced on that. Um, and... Um, uh, and I wanted to I wanted to talk about that as an adaptation because I think that it is a fascinating. We've had several requests to talk about the Wheel of Time, um, and I'm excited to do that. Maggie does not know the Wheel of Time books; she's not read them. Uh, so uh, I I knew she was going to be here this week, so I was like, I'm going to take the opportunity to talk about Wheel of Time. Um, uh, but so Maggie had a few things that she kind of wanted to say about the adaptation, but um, you know about like the production that is. But uh, but anyway, I figured I would just go ahead and we can talk about the Wheel of Time in Maggie's absence. So anyway, I'd, let me start off just by kind of throwing this out there. Um, I, I I hear people bad mouthing the Wheel of Time up and down, right? Um, I thought this was a brilliant adaptation. I I really love the Wheel of Time adaptation that was just released. Like the, I think that the this was a really really good adaptation, um, immensely thoughtful, handles the book very very well. Um, are, does it make some changes? Of course it does. All adaptations must make changes. But I actually thought, um, uh, I actually thought that the changes they made they made way fewer changes than I was expecting. Um, I, I, I was actually really surprised. Um, I would call that adaptation actually a very faithful adaptation. Um, and I honestly don't understand a very large portion of... Um, I don't understand a very large portion of the criticism about it, even. Um, in fact, many of the things that I've heard people complaining about, um, like on Twitter or whatever, um, have been things which actually I'm like, that's not actually what the book says. Uh, or rather, like, uh, um, you know, I, I one person uh, just recently who was talking about it with me on Twitter, um, who was complaining about the things that Moiraine says in the opening voiceover. Um, and she was, like, appalled at, like, how they've changed the books. And I'm like, that's almost a quotation from the books. In fact, there's not a change at all. Um, when Moraine talks about how, uh, you know, men in their arrogance tried to contain the Dark Lord um, and that it all backfired. And I'm like, yeah, yeah, that's actually, in fact, the premise of the story. Again, it's almost word for word taken from it's the, the, that quotation is from a much later book. It's not from the Wheel of Time book um, because the way that Robert Jordan kind of progressively reveals the world and the backstory. We don't know the whole story of, you know, Luz Theron, Telamon and, you know, the, the first dragon and the breaking of the world and all this stuff. We hear about it, but we don't learn the whole backstory. Um, we only learn, like, what happened? How did this come to be? Uh, you know, what actually went down back in the day when uh, uh, the dragon went mad and broke the world? We don't, we don't discover that for many books. <clears throat> but um, anyway, I was um, uh, I was I was really impressed. Now, this doesn't mean I loved everything about it. There are lots of things I didn't like. There, there are some some things they did that I wasn't a huge fan of. Um, but there are very very few things that they did that seemed to me wholly unjustified or out of touch with the books. Um, indeed, there's only one uh, one element that I would point to, like, if I had to list things that I think are really significant changes, they're very, very few. One at the beginning and one at the end of season one. And by the way, I'm not going to do the, the like, no spoilers thing, right? Uh, the show has been released for months. Uh, the books have been out for decades. So I'm going to speak through the rest of this episode as if er everyone who's listening has seen season one that has been dropped on Amazon Prime and has uh, read the books, right? So if you, are sen if you haven't seen it and are sensitive about spoilers, watch it and come back and, and watch the recording of this afterwards because I'm gonna I'm gonna freely talk about everything uh, in the um, uh, in the in the series um, but um, <clears throat> anyway okay so let's kind of go through and think and again I am very happy to I don't I don't want to I, I certainly don't want anybody to think that by coming out and saying I think it's a brilliant adaptation I'm trying to like shut anybody down uh who has objections I, I'm really happy to talk about that in fact I would really love to engage with that because 
here's the thing. I have, I mean, obviously, uh, and we've talked about this before, uh, I have seen, I have been the ad hominem victim of a very great deal of very sloppy, very, um, what seems to me very intellectually unprincipled attacks on the uh, Rings of Power series that's coming up, most of the hatred being directed at Amazon because this is being funded by Amazon. And I'd, I've heard lots and lots of hatred. You know, the, the, like the, the, the word on the internet is that the Wheel of Time adaptation sucks and everybody hates it. But that's just exactly what I see the very small minority of very noisy professional haters saying about the Rings of Power series, too. And I don't believe that that is true in Tolkien fandom. So, uh, Robert Jordan fans, I would love to hear from you today. Um, to talk about thoughts you had, questions you had, um, and uh, objections you had, um, I think it's um, it's really uh, I would I would love uh, I would love to actually talk with people who have read the books and don't just object to it either because it's an Amazon production or because there was multiracial casting or whatever. Which again, holy cow! How can you even object to that in Robert Jordan? Like his world is enormous, and they did some shifting. Uh, that is, some of the people who are probably white in the books were brown in the series, and some of the you know, but but that like there's a whole multi-ethnic thing, you know. Some of the people who are brown are white in the movies, so like I, you know, I'm I'm not sure the premise that they made there. I'd have to think about that a little more and see how it unfolds to uh, see what I think about the rationale that they were using when they were deciding like how they wanted people from different parts of the world to look, right? Um, but but to be perfectly honest, I don't feel that there's a a very clear rationale about that in the book either, nor is it per perfectly obvious. Um, there are some things that are some way, there are some ways in which uh, Jordan, like Tolkien, doesn't spend a whole lot of time. I mean, he mentions skin color in some cases, but there are some cases where he doesn't really talk about skin color. And one could assume that if he doesn't talk about, you know, maybe one could assume if he doesn't talk about it, then he's describing white people. Um, I don't necessarily make that assumption. So just one quick example here. The Borderlanders, right? So at the end of the season one of the series, as at the end of book one of the, of the book series, uh, the story goes to Shinar uh, up in the north in the Borderlands. And we're not really told much. We're told that like the Borderlanders are all like rugged and stuff. And we're told that they characteristically wear their hair in top knots, like the warriors wear their hair in top knots. That's one of the things that keeps, that's like one of the markers. Uh, there's so many characters and so many uh, nations and everything in, 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 um, um, in, in the Wheel of Time series that, uh, you know, they, they, Robert Jordan uses a lot of like, um, typical markers to just kind of help you like little sort of flags to help you remember who's who. Right. Uh, so like the men, the warriors from Shinar all have top knots. So when you see a warrior with a top knot, you're like, okay, he's from Shinar. Right. I got it. Just as like the Kyrianen are really short. Right. So, uh, okay. This, this dude's like really short. He's probably from, from, from Kyrian and they wear like stripes on their uniforms. So against another thing striped, uh, short dude with like stripes, horizontal stripes on his uniform. Okay. He's from Kyrian. He, he does that kind of thing, which again, he almost has to. It's really, um, uh, it, it's, there's so many uh, uh, people uh, that it would be hard to, um, um, uh, that, it, that, that it, it would be hard to keep track. Anyway, okay. So in the series, they made the, Shine, the Shinarans Asian, basically. Um, I, you know, is that a change? Like, do we know for sure? Like, is that actually, I felt that the way that that, what, that the Shinaran culture was depicted uh, in the series felt to me very true to the way that Shinar was depicted there. Um, uh, and the, so anyway, like that was just, again, one example um, that, uh, uh, that I gave about the, but okay, hang on, let me look at some, um, let me look at some, uh, some, some comments here. All right. Um, Let's see. Okay, Brett was saying, I think it's a great show. Um, for me, it was almost unrecognizable from the book. That could be in part because I'm a linear person them and wanted them not to jump around and move plot points. Oh, man, Brett. This, of course, was one of the big things, right? Um, I, as soon as I heard that there was going to be a screen adaptation of The Wheel of Time... I was like, oh man, I can't wait to see 
how they handle the plot of this story. Because, look, let me be perfectly clear. I love Robert Jordan. Um, the Wheel of Time series is in my, you know, definitely in my top five favorite fantasy series of all time. I've been a Robert Jordan fan since the first book came out in the 90s. Um, I wasn't around when The Lord of the Rings was published, right? And I always am envious of the people who are like, I remember the day when The Fellowship of the Ring came out and, um, and all that stuff. Like, I'm always envious of people who are old enough to remember that. I never had that experience. Um, I did have the experience of reading The Wheel of Time as soon as it was released. Um, I remember, you know, coming home from my freshman year of college and growing up with the great hunt. Uh, absolutely. Like, uh, so I've been a Robert Jordan fan for a long time. I've read the series multiple times, the entire series multiple times, which is quite a feat as it's like 14,000 pages long. Um, so please understand that any criticism, any critiques that I give of Robert Jordan, any, um, disparaging comments I may appear to make about Robert Jordan or the series are set in love and affection. Okay. So I just want to make sure that's perfectly clear. Um, but holy cow. Um, that series, the plot and character list of that series is more out of control than any, like, uh, Robert Jordan, um, it's like, you know how some people will say, you can see where J.K. Rowling got famous in writing the Harry Potter series, like, when they ceased to edit her work, right, and you got, like, the short, slim, uh, really tight storylines of the first three books and then you get the Goblet of Fire and the Order of the Phoenix, right? And they're all these huge, colossal things. Well, Robert Jordan was like that from day one, <laughs> right? I mean, seriously. Um, it is uh, it is amazing. Brett says he may have taken the world building a little too far. Yeah, no, Brett, I don't think he takes the world building too far. What I think that if Robert Jordan has um, a flaw in this, it's he includes too much of it. Um, I was thinking of Robert Jordan the whole time last night, and when we were doing a spoiling Lord of the Rings last night, um, we were discussing we're discussing the Ringo South. And it's the we're in the paragraphs that are just describing their journey south of Rivendell. And one of the things that I was commenting on last night is that it's very remarkable to me. Tolkien, um, he does all the back work. Right. Like he 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 knows day by day. He has a day by day journal of the events of their journey. Right. He knows exactly the calendar days they leave and the calendar days they arrive at each place. He knows what phase the moon is in. He's worked all these details out. Right. But a lot of the time, even most of the time reading the book, you wouldn't know it. Right. He go. He does not go out of his way to mention the stuff like all the information that he has on it. Robert Jordan can't help himself, right? Um, Robert Jordan is very thorough in his world building, and I love it. I love that about The Wheel of Time. It's one of the things that makes The Wheel of Time one of my favorite fantasy series, is that I feel that the the, the world in The World of Time is one of the best, most fully realized worlds of any fantasy novel I know. And, um, uh, and um, anyway, so... Um, but what Robert Jordan will do, right? So he will he will decide, okay, there's this group of Aes Sedai who's gonna go and visit there's like this group of thirteen Aes Sedai who are gonna like say the group of uh the group of Aes Sedai that um uh, uh you know Elida sends to Kyrian to meet with Rand, the ones who uh who end up um acting badly. Um and there's like there's like 13 or 15 of them in the end uh that that are there. There's 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 a whole bunch. So Robert Jordan of course, okay, he's worked it all out. He knows all of them and all of their names and where they're from and the names of their warders and everything else, right? But unlike Tolkien, he doesn't restrain himself. He just tells us, right? He just lists it. He's like, and then they all came in and then he'll give us their names. Like, boom, 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 like 15 names of all these people. And he'll give us something of their descriptions. Like, and she was like tall and she was fat and she was like, you know, I, I, everything. Like, there's something about everybody. So, Okay, like it's like, Robert, I'm glad you've worked all this out. It's really important, and it will pay dividends in indirect ways if you have all this detail worked out. But holy cow, I don't actually need to know. Like, I don't need to know everybody's name and what they all look like. Like, only tell me these things if I need to remember. I get all these false leads, right? So I'm like, oh, I guess all these people are going to be important. But no, actually, more than half of them will never come up again. But he's told me, right? Anyway, 
This is how Robert Jordan thinks. This is how Robert Jordan writes. This is why Robert Jordan's books are a thousand pages each, <laughs> right? And again, I like it's luxurious, um, luxurious. Uh, he will, you know, if you're interested in like knowing every detail and hearing every incident, um, uh, you know, like he'll give you a, the day by day of like what everybody is doing. And again, all of that stuff is it's fun. And I love it. And I will sit and I will read. By the way, I listen to the audiobooks and I listen to them at 1x. And I will listen to them again and again. Um, it, it's an investment. It takes a while. Each audiobook is about 40 hours and there are 14 of them. Do the math. It's a long time. Um, and um, anyway, so I, 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 I'm, I'm there for it. Like, I'm, I, I have the patience for it. I totally, I never criticize people who don't like Robert Jordan or can't get into it. I'm like, look, I don't blame you. Um, I love it. I can do it. I'm happy. But, um, but anyway, this is how he writes. This is how he thinks. So again, my very first thought when I heard that this was going to be adapted was, holy cow, there's an immense amount of cutting that's going to have to be done in order to, to take this story. In, no matter how long the series is going to be, even if they are planning a 10 season series to cover the whole Wheel of Time plot, which, by the way, I'll be very surprised if they're going to be allowed to do. Um, I, I think it would have been very foolish of them to set out planning a 10 season series uh, for the Wheel of Time. Um, so I don't know how many seasons, if anyone knows this information, you can tell me, I have no idea how many seasons they have projected, uh, you know, they're hoping to do in order to complete, you know, uh, in order to complete the story and get all the way through Tarman Gaiden, um, uh, which is the last battle, by the way, for those of you who don't know it, um, the climactic like last battle of the age, um, which is the basically the place where the story, the story, believe it or not, the story ends uh, at the apocalypse. So that's uh, more or less the end of the story. Um, <clears throat> but um, anyway, so um, uh, they <laughs> just give every name character one episode, JJ. Yeah, exactly. It would be longer than the Simpsons if they did that. <laughs> Seriously, you have no idea. Um, but um, anyway, okay, okay. So <clears throat> I... Yeah, it would be at least 200 seasons, Brett, exactly, if they, if they were doing that. So, obviously, no matter how large a scope they have given within the structure of their show, they're going to have to compress, right? Absolutely have to massively compress things in order to make this work. And not just work for the sake of... Um, you know, fitting in before the show gets canceled, right? Which have, has got to be their goal, right? When they start. Um, but even like to make it a show that's even tolerable for an audience to watch. Again, the first book is like 40 hours. The audio book is 40 hours. So to read the full narrative in the form that Jordan delivered it is 40 hours long. And it would be unwatchable. As is, it would be unwatchable. Uh, the, the way that Robert Jordan depicts the amount of time he spends describing their days of travel, for instance. Again, I was I was thinking about this last night, looking at the, the really efficient couple paragraphs in which Tolkien kind of captures their experience of those first few weeks of journey when they leave Rivendell. Um, Robert Jordan makes you feel it. Uh, I, the, the metaphor I used, uh, last night when I, in that class, when I was talking about that, the contrasting example I gave of like what Tolkien is not doing in those, in those paragraphs was of course the incredibly painful, uh, camping sequences, uh, in Harry Potter and the Deathly Hallows. And I used that example because I knew that more people would be familiar with that one. I could have used Rand and Matt on the road to Camelin as my example. Um, I have a, a, a friend from college. He and I were both Robert Jordan fans, and that was that was our standard. Like that was our, our the inside joke between the two of us for years. Whenever we were talking about a story and a place where a story began to drag in unnecessary detail, right? Um, we used to call that a random Matt on the road to came one situation. Uh, it is um, uh, it is remarkable. <laughs> it is remarkable, uh, and. Um, so let me actually take that as an illustration of what I think they do so well in this adaptation. I thought it was an elegant adaptation. Their, 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 the way they handled the plot, I felt was truly elegant in the show. It's the thing I admired the most. Um, because, so 
they so let's take that sequence as an example. So Rand and Matt are on the road to Kamon. What's happening? It's a long block of text that feels to me three times as long as it actually is. Um, and uh, um, okay, so what is what happens when Rand and Matt are on the road to Kamon after they've so in Shadar Logoth the the, the you know so the group gets together in the two rivers, they leave the two rivers, they end up at Shadar Logoth, they end up having to split up in Shadar Logoth, and the the trajectory of the plot followed that same shape uh, in the series as well. Um, then it, so that now there's like three different subgroups that are now, we're all following in the same detail. And this, by the way, is why the series is so incredibly long. I've seen a couple people, um, who have commented that they got as far as book four or five and then kind of gave up because it felt like it was lacking direction. I saw at least one person say they got to nine or 10 and then gave up. Um, by the way, that is exactly, um, that is exactly, um, the experience that many, many people have had. And I will admit, I myself gave up on Robert Jordan. And after book nine, um, when book nine came out, I despaired. I did. I confess it. I had a moment of despair. As much as I love the Wheel of Time, I was like, this is never, ever, ever going to end. There is no way this man is ever going to be able to finish this series. Because nine books, it was a thousand pages, right? And yet it didn't seem to be coming any nearer. Uh, like every single book was like opening more and more and more subplots um, as like the group divide, you know, like that thing that happens at Shadar Logoth, right? Where you've got the original group of people that splits up into three smaller groups of people. And then they kept splitting up. And then every individual character was being followed in the run. I mean, it was the number of subplots. He got to the point in the middle of the series where he had to skip subplots for entire books because he just couldn't have time to um, uh, to, to, to get there. Curious Gene, I agree. Boy, the search for the bowl of the winds goes on so long, so long. Um, and again, that sense of despair. This is never, I love this story, but the story that I love is never going to finish, right? Um, I totally get that. I absolutely, absolutely get that. And, um, and as I said, I experienced that myself. I came back to the Wheel of Time when I heard that Brandon Sanderson went, basically when Robert Jordan died. So Robert Jordan died and I, I you know, I briefly mourned him, but it, I didn't mourn him in the same way that I would have mourned. Like I didn't mourn the ending, like the, like to saying, oh no, now the series will never be finished. Cause I'd already concluded the series was never going to be finished. Right. I'm quite convinced that if Robert Jordan had lived another 40 years, he would never have finished that series. Um, but then I heard that after his death, it got handed over to Brandon Sanderson. And I was like, okay, I'm going to reread it now. Um, so when Sanderson finished the series, I went back and reread the whole thing. And I have to tell you, I was transformed. Like my reading experience was transformed simply by knowing how many books, knowing that it ended, right? That Brandon Sanderson ended it and knowing where it ended, that it ended after book 14. Knowing that, knowing that there was, then I could, so when I got to book nine, this was, of course, my whole problem. I was like in book eight, book nine, and saying to myself, like, oh man, we're nowhere near the end. This is not coming to an end. Well, now I could be like, okay, well, it's 14 books, right? So yes, it's book nine, and we still seem really far from the end, but there are still five volumes left in this series. And I'm like, okay, I could see, um, um, I could see that, uh, um, in five volumes, there's, there's a fighting chance of actually getting there. And, um, uh, uh, and he had to rush it. Uh, Brandon Sanderson had to kind of rush some of the things. Like there are some of the subplots that get a little accelerated and uh, resolve a little bit suddenly, right? Compared to the pace at which they were before. But that was exactly the medicine that that series required in order to bring it to an end. Um, anyway, so I found it was, it was a complete, it was, my experience was totally different knowing um, that um, that it had an end and where knowing where the end was. Anyway, so you're adapting this show for uh, a series, right? You must compress. So again, back to Rand and Matt on the road to Camelot. What happens to Rand and Matt on the road to Camelot? Well, there are two major, three, three major plot things that are accomplished 
by that sequence of Rand and Matt on the road to K1. There's some minor things that you could say too, but there are three major things, right? One is Matt gets sick, right? Matt has taken the dagger from, uh, from Shadow Logoth with a ruby on the hilt, and he is being progressively infected, right? So we see the slow progression of Matt's in like infection, uh, corruption, basically magical corruption uh, from the dagger uh, where they have uh, no Camwen is not where they meet Min. That was in Berlon, um, which got they. I actually loved what they did with Min, but we'll come back to that. Okay, so Matt's progressive illness, his corruption by the by the evil of Shatter Logoth, is one of the things that we see happening progressively. Well, in the book, over several chapters, uh, long chapters, while Rand and Matt are on the road to Camwen. The second thing that we see is that the Dark One is hunting for them. They are ambushed, trapped, identified, hunted by several dark friends, right? So and so this shows us a couple things. One, there are dark friends everywhere. People who have sworn allegiance uh, to the Dark One, right? And who are serving him uh, and taking his orders. The mere fact that all these... There were accusations of people being dark friends, but it sounded like just witch hunt stuff. Um, you could, you kind of got the impression, like, are there really that many dark friends, or is this just a, a thing that grumpy people say to try to slander folks, right? Um, when Random Matter on the Road to came, when we see... No, actually, there are dark friends all over the place, right? And they're hunting for Rand and Matt and Perrin as well, right? Okay, so, um, uh, so Rand and Matt are being hunted by the Dark One, and the Dark Friends are after them. That's it. So we've got Matt's corruption. We've got their being hunted by the Dark One, uh, and by, uh, through Dark Friends, um, and of course pursuit by Fades as well, by um, the Merdral as well. The eyeless white. I loved the way they depicted the Merdral. Um, it didn't look like how I'd pictured them. But it was way better than how I'd pictured them. I loved the the visual depiction of the Murdral, uh in the show. It was one of my fa- actually like the, the the Trollocs and the and the Fades were fantastic. I thought, um, yes, autoflagellator. I totally agree. The white cloaks, um, both like the the like the Senbui character, like the crotchety old village dude um, from Emmons Field at the beginning, and then the white cloaks. Um, very clearly give the impression that the dark friend accusation is just an excuse for persecution. It's like a, 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 a justification of, um, you know, for uh, the, them to just you know slander people and to exert power over them. Um, okay. So again, the, so major things being accomplished, Rand and Matt on the road to Camelot. Uh, Matt's uh, progressive corruption by the dagger, dagger from Shatter Logoth. Um, re- uh, the fact that the Dark One has his agents, in fact, pursuing them, and that there are dark friends all over the place looking to kill them, right? Also, the two of them being out on their own, right? And having to survive and um, having to... Uh, like, this is the first time they're out on their own, and they have to take action... Uh, of, of, you know, so how are they going to survive? How are they going to make it? That's sort of another, that's a kind of a minor thing, but it's a big deal for their character development. The third thing, of course, is the very first overt instance of Rand channeling, right? The first clear evidence. Now, we're told later on this is not, in fact, the first time he's channeled, um, but you don't pick up on the fact when he channels the first time, he doesn't know it and the reader doesn't know it. You can see it retroactively, right? Moraine identifies it, um, uh, it's you know when they're when they're leaving and uh, the horses are really tired and except for the horse that Egwene is riding because Rand was mentally cheering on the horse and so he unconsciously channeled to remove the fatigue from the horse. Um, Moraine notices this because she notices that like that horse seems to be unnaturally uh, anyway so she picks up on it but the re- but uh, as a reader you miss it the first time through he doesn't really draw attention to it. The first time that something like genuinely freaky unexplained magical happens around Rand. The first out exterior evidence of his channeling happens um, when they're trapped by dark friends uh, and about to be killed and he like blows open the wall of the inn uh, where the, in the room where they're trapped uh, and they escape. So those are the three biggest things. Matt's corruption, the fact that dark friends are chasing them, and Rand's um, uh, Rand, the first instance of Rand channeling uh, in a way that we can see. Right. Um, The show accomplishes all three of those things and exactly those three things. 
right? It accomplishes those three things in one episode, right? In one 45 minute, in part of one 45 minute episode. This is the episode when they go, when they, after, so Rand and Matt are together uh, after they flee from Shadar Logoth and they get to that like mining, um, that mining town, which is also kind of a stand in for Barillon as well. The first sort of town of any size uh, that they get to after they leave the two rivers. Um, it kind of takes the place of that in the shape of the plot, sort of. Uh, not exactly, but it kind of does. Um, but anyway, you think about what happens to them, the things that happen to them in that in that episode, in that, in that, by episode, I don't actually mean episode of the show. I mean, in that incident, uh, in the show, uh, Rand and Matt being at that, uh, that, that mining town, all three of the things that are accomplished by that very long and drawn out and really drawn out sequence in the book are accomplished there. They are trapped by a dark friend, right? Um, by, a woman, a very friendly woman who turns out to be a dark friend, right? Which is actually a parallel to an incident that occurs um, in the book uh, when Random Matter on the Road to Camelot. Um And uh, of course, Matt is also showing, beginning to show signs of the, his progressive corruption by the da dagger from Shadow Logoth. Um, and of course, there, Rand is trapped by the dark friend and uses. Like, you know, he's trying to beat his way through a door, uh, which the dark friend says three men could not possibly break that. It's ironwood. Three men couldn't possibly break down that door. And Rand breaks it down and we can see the glow of the power. Um, I mean, when you when you watch carefully, like knowing what uh, knowing what you're looking for. Right. You can see evidence of the powers, the like the visual effect that shows the usage of the one power um, when he does that. And so like in the book, that incident is the first time in which Rand visibly, visibly to the viewer is channeling. You might miss it. Right. It's, uh, um, you know, it's 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 possible to miss it, but it's there. Right. So they accomplish all three of the things that are accomplished in that long series of plots in a sequence which on screen takes maybe 20 minutes of screen time. But they did more. Like, in addition to that, they accomplished a bunch of other things. The meeting with Tom Marilyn, right, um, which they which they displaced from the Shire. The Shire, listen to me. From the Two Rivers. <laughs> I talk about Tolkien all day. From the Two Rivers, which is the parallel to the Shire in this case, um, uh, to that you know, mining village, they, they displaced that, which I thought was a really interesting choice and worked really well. Um, uh, Robert Jordan loves to introduce, um, uh, like scads of characters all at once, like all of whom are going to be really important later on. And it's okay. He pays that off by the amount of time you spend with them, right? You're going to spend so much time with them that you'll get a chance to know. So even though he is simultaneously, Introducing us to Rand, Matt, Perrin, Egwene, Moraine, Lan, and Tom Marilyn all at once. So like the seven of them leave the two rivers together, right? Um, it works because <laughs> we spent so much time with those seven characters. Oh, wait, uh, uh, and then Nynaeve, right, who comes in. So the eighth who doesn't leave with them, but who joins them later on. But again, we spend so much time with those seven and then eight characters that we eventually get to know them all, right? But in the much more compressed time scale, which has to be, I mean, you've just got fewer minutes, right? Um, in the in the fewer minutes that you need, that you have on screen, you can't just do that. You can't just slap seven to eight major characters uh, in one shot and be like, and now get to know all of these at once, please, right? And become like engaged with all of these people on screen all at once. It's really hard to do as it was. They kept it to, they, they, they actually did ask us to connect with at least six at once, right? And that was already a big ask, right? They kept the three boys and Egwene and Moraine and Lan, right? And those six leave the two rivers together. They have Nynaeve come and join them later on, as happened in the book. And they um, uh, they pushed off Tom Marilyn until later on. Um, so again, I thought that that was um, a very... Um, a very sensible kind of change to make. Anyway, my point is, 
what they accomplish in that time in the mining village. Plus, they get, you know, character development with Matt and the tension between Matt and Rand, which is one of the places where we begin to see the corruption beginning to take hold on Matt. Um, and uh, um, and I love the new dimension that they added to Matt's character. Um, I thought it was really interesting, um, but I thought it was... Uh, uh, I mean, I, Matt's hard because Matt is uh, one of my very favorite characters in the book. Matt and Perrin are my favorite characters. And um, I... Um, there's some things I didn't like about what they did to his character, but I actually, but I was very interested in it. Um, the thing that I found most compelling about the, the sort of the new backstory they gave, uh, to, um, to Matt was, um, his relationship with his sisters, right? They made his sisters much younger. So instead of just having a bunch of bratty younger siblings who are a little bit younger than he is, um, and who used to tattletale on him, which is basically the story between him and Bode uh, and his other sisters uh, in the book, um, they made the age gap very significant between him and his sisters. And they had his, you know, his parents... Uh, neglectful uh, and incompetent in various ways, irresponsible and, and incompetent. And Matt being the one who has this sense of responsibility, who's caring for his little sisters um, and really struggling with that. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I, I, I loved that. I thought that was a really fascinating angle to his character. He is connected to his family. Um, and it gave, it gave a little differentiation among the three boys sooner on. Right. Um, Matt was, Matt was from a disadvantaged background, right? I mean, he is a, at least neglected and possibly abused child, right? Who is trying to care for his younger, definitely neglected and possibly abused sisters, right? Um, and that was kind of like the bedrock of his character. So you can begin to see like his his gambling, right? And his desire to make money and even his cynicism are all kind of connected with his, um, you know, desire to get out and escape from, uh, you know, the, the, the world that he had known. Um, anyway, I, I thought that was really, really interesting. Um, anyway, but sorry, I'm digressing. Let me, let me come back to that. Some of the things that they did, some of the changes they made in the lives of the characters, I found really interesting and were some of my favorite parts. So let's go back and we'll talk about some of those changes that were made later on. But um, anyway, I think I'm kind of done talking about Random Matt on the Road to Camelin. I'm choosing that as an illustration to talk about how the work that Robert Jordan spread out over like 150 pages of text... Um, the show accomplished and it, it it ticks off all of the boxes that get checked during those 150 pages. And it ticked them off in like 15 minutes of screen time. And that's what I mean when I said, I thought it was a really elegant adaptation. Um, I was, I was saying to myself when I was sitting down to watch the wheel of time adaptation, I'm like, if they can successfully compress this plot and make it intelligible, I'm going to be super impressed. And I was super impressed by, by that element. I was definitely um, super impressed. Um, now let's talk about changes because of course, this is the first thing uh, that people um, comment on, right? Obviously this is always a problem. Um, this is always a problem with, um, uh, this is always a problem with, Adaptations, right? That people always have with adaptations. It's a, it is, and it's, you know, we've talked about this, you know, in this, uh, in this series, in the Our Other Minds and Hands series, quite a bit at the beginning. Um, it's very difficult to separate oneself from the emotional reaction to seeing an adaptation, and there are two different levels of reaction, right? Um, what you're seeing is almost certain to be different from what you know, but that in two ways, right? It's not only that some of the details of the story and the characters are likely to be altered from what they are in the book. And there are reasons why this needs to be done. You cannot just take a book as is and project it um, on the screen. And that is doubly true, <laughs> trebly, quintuply true of The Wheel of Time. <laughs> it's just not possible. Um... So you have, they have to make changes. So, but, 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 but even beyond that, right? Even some of the things that are not changed, that are not altered, stories 
elements, character elements that are not altered from the book. We often have the same kind of negative reactions to it. We look at it and say, that's wrong. That's wrong. Right? Because it's different from the picture we had in our heads. Right? That's not what that character looked like in my head. Um, that's not what that place looked like in my head. That's not what those people sounded like. And the problem is that what I see, what I see and hear from a lot of people who react on so social media about things like this is that they're not stopping to really analyze their feelings, right? That kind of feeling is totally natural. It's totally natural. We all have those feelings when we see adaptations, right? But you've, if you want to have a, like, respectable analytical response to something. It's okay to have your feelings, right? That's totally fine. And you don't have to like it. It's okay to dislike it. Um, I keep saying both of these things, but if you want to say, to make analytical conclusions, like that's bad, that's a bad adaptation. You can say, I don't like it all day long, but if you want to say that it's a bad adaptation, that's a claim that needs to be supported. And the merely emotional support you know, the mere statement, I dislike it because it's different from the book. That's not, that's not reason enough to condemn it at all. Um, and certainly that's different. It feels different from how the books felt to me. Um, that character looks different than the character in my head. Um, that is, um, uh, that is, that's not, that's not, a, it's not even a criticism. That's just an emotional reaction, right? So we need to get past that. Um, okay. Let's talk about characters. I was going to, I was going to move next to talking about the biggest thing that they did change. Um, as far as like the whole world building and plot is concerned, there's one major change, um, really major. There's only one thing that I would identify as like a fundamental and structural change that they made to the world and the story. Um, and that is to the, the idea that the dragon could potentially re be reborn as a girl. Um, the fact that that's on the table in the series, that's a significant change from the book. And I say, when I say significant, I mean, again, that's a change to like the bedrock of the story, right? Now, I don't dislike that change. I think it works just fine. In fact, there are things that I like about it, but... Um, We'll come back to that because I see a lot of people want to talk about characters and let's by all means talk about characters. Um, yes. Curious Jean says they did Abel Cawthon dirty. No question. If I were uh, the publicity agent for Abel Cawthon, who is Matt's father, um, I, uh, I would have slandered for, for, uh, or, or sued for slander. Like no question. Um, they did Abel Cawthon dirty. Absolutely. But, um, but I think it's a very defensible change, right? Think about how this works in the books. Rand and Matt, right? Rand and Matt, but now parents, parents are non-characters. We never really learn anything about parents, parents until they die, right? Um, I told you, I'm not holding back for spoilers. You've had decades to read the series. Um, so the fact that they're killed is an important plot element of the story, but they are not, their influence on his character, their presence in his mind is negligible. Perrin is always thinking back to Master Luhan uh, and his and to Mr. and Mrs. Luhan, right? His uh, his master as a blacksmith. He was apprenticed to the blacksmith in Emmonsfield, Mr. Uh, uh, master Luhan. He's the one. He and his wife um, are the ones that Perrin is always. They're his parental figures, right? So when he th thinks back to his life in the two rivers and he thinks back to like the lessons he's learned in his youth, he's always thinking back to what Master Luhan taught him. Whereas Rand and Matt are both thinking back to uh, Tam, Althor, and Abel Cawthon, right? to their fathers primarily, to their mothers. Well, uh, Rand's mom died when he was young, so he doesn't think back to his mother. Matt thinks back to his mom sometimes, but. Um, uh, but it's primarily about their dads. Um, those are the characters that come up most often and indeed play roles, especially Tam, to a much lesser extent, Abel Cawthon, uh, later on in the, in the, in the series. Um, now, think about their relationship. In the books, think about Rand and Matt's relationships to their fathers. Their fathers aren't the same characters. That is, you know, Matt's father is a farmer and a horse trader, right? 
Um, so Matt learns different skills. Like he learns his skills of like evaluating horse flesh from his father. Whereas Rand, um, you know, learns about sheep herding, right. From his father. Um, so they're not identical in that way, but the kind of role that they have in the story is practically identical. Right. Their two dads turn out to be like really awesome at everything. <laughs> right. I mean, like Tam is the best archer in the, like uh, Abel Cawthon is the best archer in the two rivers, except for Rand's dad, who's even better than he is. Right. And Tam or sorry, Abel Cawthon is the best quarterstaff fighter in the whole two rivers. Right. Um, so like nobody can beat Abel Cawthon with the quarterstaff and nobody can beat uh, uh, Tam Elthor with the bow. Um, so like they're both like exemplary and the best ever at like the things that they do. And so the things that Rand and Matt both like learn from them, this like justifies why Rand and Matt have like ex way crazy, extraordinary, wonderful abilities um, and are able to like, so like Matt, when he's barely even lucid and can scarcely stand, uh, can with his his quarterstaff defeat two guys who are going to both be, we are going to, uh, we're going to be asked to accept these two guys as two of the greatest living swordsmen in the world within a few books. Right. Um, and yet Matt is going to defeat them with his quarterstaff, both of them at the same time, while he's like feverish and can barely even stand because he's Abel Cawthon's son and learn everything he knew from Abel Cawthon. Right. Um, so, um, so Matt and Rand again, so the father figures of Matt and Rand are parallel to each other. The role that they play in the story is functionally identical and all of them, all three of the boys have this like super wholesome, clean background. Right. Um, their backstories, again, they're not identical in every way, right? Perrin was an apprentice and neither of the other two were. Rand's mom died when he was young and both of the other two had both of their parents. Um, anyway, like th th there are some distinctions among them, right? But in general, they all, they're all in the same bucket, right? They're all in the same bucket. Wonderful upbringing from extraordinary people who love them very much, right? That's the back history of all three of the boys from the two rivers. In the show, then, they make a choice and they say, we're going to change that about Matt, right? Let's have one of the three boys have a different family story, right? So they did Abel Cawthon dirty, right? Instead of making Abel Cawthon just as... No, they, they kept Tam, right? Tam is still awesome, right? Awesome dad, loving dad, uh, sort secret sword master with, like, interesting military, secret military history, all that stuff, Right? All that stuff is still true. So like they kept Rand's backstory basically the same, right? But they say so but they made a choice to change Matt's. And they said, okay, we we're gonna make one of them have a more complicated background. Right? We're gonna um we're gonna have one of them um uh we're gonna have one of them have a, a bad family background, right? Come from a neglective, abusive family. And I think that of the three of them, Matt's a wonderful choice for that. It, um, when I, I was thinking about Matt's, like who Matt is in the book and the character that he comes to be, um, I feel like that, f the character that he is going to have fits the, his neglected, abusive background that they gave him in the show far better than either of the other two. Um, it would have been, it would have done more of like the kind of person Perrin goes on to be does not jive well with that. The kind of person Matt goes on to be actually kind of does, right? Um, why is it that Matt never wants to go back to the two rivers in the books? Book Matt has no interest in ever returning home to the two rivers. Why? because he wants to see the world, because he's kind of an adventurous lad, because having been out and seen the big world and seen like life of, uh, uh, you know, glamour and luxury, he never wants to return to rustic farm living. Um, okay. I mean, it, it works for me. I'm able to live with it in the book, but it's not a compelling story at all. Um, they've taken those again, but then you take those same elements, right? Matt, who having gone off and sought his fortune and come up in the world and now doing all these things, decides I'm never going back to that two-bit village that I came from. 
film mat, right? Seri- uh, TV mat. That that works compellingly with the backstory that they've given him. Um, so yeah, I, I I thought I you know so I, as soon as I saw that in episode one, right, the way that they were playing Abel Cawthon and Matt's backstory, I was like, whoa, that's different. But then I w- thought it through and was thinking about okay, thinking about Matt's character trajectory from the books, right? Not no, not assuming it's going to be identical in the series, but thinking about it from the books. And I said, you know what? Yeah, it it works. Um, it uh, that th- I think that that works really well. Now take Perrin's character. They make Perrin married, right? So Perrin has a wife in episode one. That's a huge change. None of them were married in the book, right? So why do they make Perrin married, right? Now, again, here's the thing that you always have. This is what I I strongly recommend. Here's my humble suggestion. Um, um, uh, Oh, yeah, uh, JJ, you're right. Matt being terribly uncomfortable with responsibility fits show Matt's backstory as well. Yeah, no, it does. It absolutely does. Um, A kind of distrust of himself, right? Is he just going to follow? I mean, that accusation gets placed on him, right? His mom says you're going to grow up to be just like your dad, right? Um, Matt's own discomfort with having a kind of distrust of himself. That's definitely an element of book Matt's character. But I agree the show, the new background that the show has given to Matt makes that element of his character much more interesting, much more compelling, actually. Um, uh, Okay, okay, but back to Perrin. So in the show, Perrin's married, right? So I was just about to say, here's my suggested antidote. When you're struggling through, right? Um, uh, When you're struggling through a change, right? You see a change, right? Staring you in the face and you're like, holy cow, that's different from the book, right? Here's what I would say that you must accept. Of course, you're under no compulsion. Uh, Apparently, you know, presumably, uh, you know, uh, Grendel has not laid compulsion upon you, so you're free to think about it and feel whatever you like. But, um, so I won't say must, but I should, um, I would, what I would suggest, right? Um, is that um, instead of, in my mind, the antidote to um, the emotional reaction, the that's different and therefore wrong, right? Like that, that, we all feel that way. We all have that reaction. The antidote to that is to stop, take a deep breath, stop and ask why, why, why? What's the function? What function does this change, but this changed thing that I'm seeing, what role does it play? How does it contribute to the story that they're telling in this show, right? How does it contribute to the story that they're saying? Um, And um, you may decide very little, or I don't like the effect that it has. And again, that's, that's fine. Often the change, sometimes changes adapters make are not very effective in my opinion. Uh, and you know, so like, that's a perfectly fine, but at least then you're really thinking about what's going on about why the changes are not just made randomly and they're not made because they don't know the books, right? It's not an act of ignorance. It's, it's, it's a choice. It's a creative choice that they have made as part of the story that they're telling. So what's the role? So now I, I say parent's story. Um, first, let's start, look at Perrin's marriage, the effect of Perrin's marriage from the perspective of the opening of episode one and from the perspective of the closing of episode one, right? First, um, that, um, the opening, right? How does it change Perrin's character that he starts the story married? And again, I did the same thing that I did with Matt, right? You know, immediately I'm like, okay, both of them have different backstories, right? Parents married, Matt is from a neglective and abusive family. Um, As with Matt, I was saying, okay, what is his character like? What are the core elements of his character? What would I want them to capture in Matt's character? What what do I think is most important? If I were adapting this show, what are the elements of their, of these characters that I would feel really need to be of their, of, of the, of, of who those people are and of the stories that they're going to be a part of? What are those things that I think are most important to capture in order to do this story justice in this adaptation? Right. Um, and having thought about those, 
how does that, you know, can I see ways in which this new backstory, this you know, the new context to this story that they're giving might help to push those things forward? Sometimes you have to make changes in order to accomplish the same thing in a different framework, right? In a different medium. Um, so I talked about Matt's thinking about parents. What is Perrin like? Well, one of the things in the book that right away from the first book on separates Perrin from the other two boys, right? Rand, Matt, and Perrin. Um, the thing that separates him from the other two, he is the biggest homebody of the lot, right? Matt wants to go out and see the world. He's excited about the opportunity for adventure. He's the one of the three of them who looks back least often uh, to the two rivers. Um, Matt, uh, Rand... It's complicated, right? Because before he leaves the two rivers, he discovers through his father's talk in his fever dreams that uh, he's pos probably not actually his father's child. Um, and so his whole like history and parentage is in question. And he's having like this big old identity crisis. Who am I really? Is the two rivers really my home? Is Tam Althor really my father? So does he look back at the two rivers? Yes. Uh, did, was he happy in the two rivers? Yes. But it's complicated. Right. So like that whole the whole question of Rand's identity complicates his relationship with the two rivers. Uh, Matt is cheerful about leaving. Right. For no very compelling reason, as I said, and I don't find any really compelling reason other than just he's an adventurous lad who wants to see the world. Perrin, of the three of them, wants to leave least. He is quiet. He is the homebody of the lot. Right. Um, he is. Um, uh He's the one who least wants to go out and see the world, who cares least about, who is least affected by rising in the world, who is most resistant to being, uh, to becoming something other than he was back in the two rivers, right? I mean, if there is one, um, if you had to, like, quote a slogan for Perine Barra in the books, right? What does he say more often than anything else in the entire books? I'm just a blacksmith, right? That's his, that's his slogan, right? If he's got a slogan in the books, that's his slogan, right? He continually identifies himself um, with his life in the two rivers and continues to do so for like almost 14 bucks. Not quite, but almost 14 bucks. Um, so he is situated, grounded, settled in the two rivers, unlike everybody else. So that was my very first reaction when I saw that he, they, they, they had, they gave him a wife before the curtain rose on the first episode, right? I was like, okay, you know, that's a really interesting way to ground Perrin in this way, right? Perrin does not want to leave. He's uh, a newlywed. He's establishing a life for himself as a blacksmith in the two rivers. Like, this is his identity. This is who, like, he's got a plan. Rand and Matt don't have plans, exactly, or at least they don't have well-formed plans. In the show, I mean, don't have clearly formed plans about what their lives are going to be, right? Matt actively is hoping for anything but his current life in the show. Um, Rand has plans, but they're not really panning out, right? Um, Perrin, he's settled, right? So for him to be torn out of the two rivers at the end of episode one in the show is a bigger disruption to his life, far bigger disruption to his life than it is to either of the other two boys. And that felt to me right. That felt to me exactly right, that that captured something in Perrin. What's more? What's the other thing that's most important about Perrin's character? For the majority of the series, I mean, not for book one. This is not relevant in, in, in the, the actual Eye of the World book. Um, but of course, Karen, Perrin's character is dominated through the majority of the series by his relationship with his wife. Perrin does, in fact, get married. He is the first of the three characters to get married um, and is, of the three of them, the one who is most identified with his wife. Um, uh, if his main slogan is, I'm just a blacksmith, his second uh, uh, slogan would be Fail! with an exclamation point, right? I mean, he's always thinking about his wife. He's always focused on his wife. Um, he is, Perrin is a quiet, stay-at-home, loving, devoted character. That's a big part of who he is, as we see very strongly foregrounded throughout the rest of the series, right? So, if you want to show that Perrin is of the three, the one who is contented and happy and most, and that 
to to make him leave the two rivers in the opening of the show is the biggest does the most violence to him as a person um is the biggest uh uh, uh displacement and and adjustment to his character establishing him giving him a wife at the beginning i loved it i'm like yeah that's that's totally to perrin totally would do that. He didn't in the book, but he would, right? Um, it very much, uh, it very much captures that. Now, so that's my f- reaction to Perrin's marriage at the beginning of episode one. Now let's talk about the end of episode one. And remember, I said I'm not apologizing for spoilers. Perrin's wife is killed at the end of episode one. Perrin accidentally kills his own wife in the melee with the Trollocs, right? Uh, he accidentally kills his wife with his own axe in the end of episode one. Um, It's a horrible, horribly painful, powerful scene. Um, I was like weeping. There were not many shows that I was like weeping in episode one, right? But I was, oh man, that was so horrible. Uh, Like I was gripped by Perrin's story, show Perrin's story. Um, that was terrible, right? Now, um, y- anybody who knows even the first book of The Wheel of Time can immediately see, right? I didn't even have to stop myself and think about that. I was like in shock when it happened. Well, not in shock because I'm like, I know Perrin's going to have to leave and he's got a wife and that's going to be inconvenient. So unless she's going to become a new character who's going to travel with them, I was, um, I was not, uh, um, I, I would not have, uh, um, you know, uh, engaged, uh, advised her to engage in any long-term investments at the beginning of episode one. But, um, so I, I kind of saw it coming is what I'm saying, but I didn't see that coming. I didn't see how it was going to happen. But of course, everybody who knows Perrin's story, again, even in, even in the eye of the world, even in volume one of the, of the books, um, knows that one of Perrin's continuous subplots, right? Uh, the one dominant element of his character development through the whole series is his relationship with violence. Um, that he is uncomfortable. He does not like hurting people. Um, he's always been a, a strong kid and trained as a blacksmith. And so he's bigger and stronger than the other boys, like all blacksmiths apprentices are. And, um, and so always had been, you know, was very gentle and tried not to hurt people. Um, and then he's got to go and he's got to fight and he fights with his axe. Right. And he hates the axe. His, the relationship between him and the axe, which is not resolved until book nine, 10, maybe 10. Anyway, it's really late. Um, as 10,000 pages later, his relationship with his ex is going to be, uh, is going to be resolved in the book. Um, but he hates his own ex, right? Uh, his ex comes to like sort of symbolically represent, uh, the, uh, he does have this tendency to violence. Like when he gets in battle, he kind of goes battle crazy and he hates that about himself. And he, so he's got a, deals with a lot of self-loathing issues. This is in the book. Now he deals with lots of self self-loathing issues, hates his ex is uncomfortable with violence. Um, in the sh- in episode one of the show, in that horrible frozen moment when Perrin in the middle of combat turns around, you know, somebody's running up towards him from behind and he turns around and, uh, plants his ax in his wife's gut. Um, I mean, it's just like immediately in that moment, like a flash, I was like, whoa, in the, sh- so that's why Perrin hates his ax. Right. So like, and that it's such a wonderful example of them accomplishing in seconds what it took Robert Jordan hundreds of pages of description to get us towards, right? To help us begin to parse out what the axe is a symbol of for Perrin, right? Um, and what this means for his character. Like they accomplished hundreds of pages of Robert Jordan character development in less than five seconds. Um, in and I was like, well, that was so powerful and really effective. I loved it. I loved it. I loved Perrin's wife in episode one. Um, uh, I thought that that was really, really powerful. Um, uh, so yeah, yeah. I, 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 I thought that was great. Um, so yeah, was, was, is there a change? Yeah. Uh-huh. Big change, big change to his character. Do I think that it, but what, 
what is the important thing is not, are there things in this show that are different from the book? The question is, you got to look at what's happening, right? What does this do for Perrin's character? Look at the big picture of Perrin's character and his character development over the course of the of the of series one of the, you know the, the uh, season one of the show and ask yourself now compare that with the development of Perrin's character in like books you know book one to two to three the early phases right of the books and when I compare those two things I think they're quite close I think it's a very sensitive adaptation of Perrin's character a very sensitive adaptation of Matt's character. And if anything, they not only managed to accomplish in a very short time what Robert Jordan did in a very long time in the books, um, not only did they accomplish that with efficiency, in several ways they actually deepen it, right? Again, it is... I not only... I, I will admit, I love Perrin's character. Perrin, is, I, Perrin and Matt are my two favorite characters in the books. I love Perrin's character. I always look forward to when the plot... Finally gets back to Perrin. Um, uh, so I, 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 I'm a big fan of Perrin in the books. But I never found his relationship with his axe very compelling. Um, my favorite thing about Perrin is his relationship with Fael. Uh, I'm a sucker for good husbands uh, in, uh, in, in books and shows. Um, uh, anyone who is uh, a really good husband who does right by his wife, um, I'm, I'm, I'm a total sucker for that. I love the, those characters because as a husband myself, I uh, um, get annoyed at uh, when husbands are depicted as uh, relentlessly uh, horrible and uh, untrustworthy at everything. So I'm a sucker for really good husbands uh, in literature and Perrin is a great husband. Uh, and I love that about Perrin. Um, but uh, but I will tell you, in the books, I never really, uh, just for me, I never really personally resonated with his thing with his acts. Especially for the first three or four books, I kept, I find myself constantly being like, Perrin, get over it, right? Get over it. Um, like it's it's not that big a deal, right? Um, what they did in the show, not only by introducing it in this deeply visceral, visceral, yikes, possibly the wrong choice of word to use when he disemboweled his wife, but anyway, um, the this 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 deep, um, <coughs> this powerful way in which it's introduced in episode one, and then later on, the fact that they actually go so far as to have Perrin attempt to follow the way of the leaf. Um, I loved that. I loved that. Perrin doesn't do that in the book. But I thought that by making him do that, by they introduced the way of the leaf. Again, they're following the text, right? Perrin and Egwene meet the, uh, the traveling people, um, the tinkers, and are introduced to the way of the leaf. And this, of course, is part of that development of Perrin's character, um, his relationship, his complicated relationship with violence and his distrust of himself. All of those things are, are, are happening there um, in the books. But, um, uh, but again, but, it, but, it's, but it's very drawn out. And his, he's, he, he objects to it. He, he doesn't have any... Um, he, he gives no truck to the way of the leaf. Um, he looks down on it from the beginning. And actually, I think that his... Um, his impatience with the Tinkers in the book. He's impatient with the Tinkers. Um, he thinks that the way of the leaf is absurd. He's like, well, you know, what if Trogs attack you? What, 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 what will you do then? And he's like, no, you know, Perrin is insisting in the book. Book Perrin says the way of the leaf doesn't make any sense. If evil comes after you and attacks you and attacks innocent people, you need to be able to defend them. And so I'm listening to Book Perrin and I'm like, okay, Book Perrin, I can get behind that. Right. OK, so you're not you're not down with the way of the leaf. You're not going to take a total pacifist vow. I agree. So wait, what's your problem with your axe again, Perrin? This is exactly why I found his conflict hard to empathize with. Um, and maybe others can. But I always had a hard time with that. I was like, which is it, Perrin? Make up your mind. Right. Um, so in the show, they really brought that out. I felt much more compellingly when Perrin um, talks to the Tinkers. And when he's essentially won over to the way of the leaf, that was, I thought that, 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 that really brought out that element of Perrin's own internal struggle much more um, powerfully to me. I could see it. I could feel it. Not to mention, of course, you know, and oh man, the power of those lines when, um, you know, when the Tinker Woman is saying to him, uh, you know, have you ever 
you know, raised a weapon in violence? And did you feel that it did you good or harm? And we're all remembering the scene of him killing his wife. I mean, it's really, really powerful, right? I thought it was very, very compelling. Um, and um, uh, so, um, so anyway, yeah. So in the end, like those are both changes, right? Perrin show Perrin saying he's gonna he's gonna he's gonna abide by the way that he's gonna adopt the way of the leaf himself. Big change from the book, right? Perrin being married at the beginning and killing his own wife. Big change from the book. Both of them, I felt, not only served the overall trajectory of the Perrin Abara character that I know from the books, but actually I felt it. It was a for me anyway. An actual, it got me there not only faster, which is absolutely necessary under the circumstances, um, but but actually more compellingly. Um, I was able to buy into that element of Perrin's struggle. And I will admit, when Perrin picks up an axe again in the last episode, right, of season one, that moment really meant something in a way that Perrin sticking with his axe, even though he hated it and was uncomfortable with it after killing the White Cloaks in the book, uh, in the Eye of the World, I mean, never really, like, it never felt like a huge moment, like a big deal. Whereas they managed <clears throat> through the way they handled the trajectory of Perrin's character over the course of season one, when he picks up that axe in the last episode, it's meaningful, right? It really hits home. Um, and I thought that was really, really interesting. Um, uh, other characters that you want to talk about? So these are why I'm so I'm 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 trying to, to to do two things, which I hope we can separate out. Right. Thing one is I'm trying to show the kind of analysis that I strongly advocate um, when you're watching an adaptation. Right. Thinking about you've got to look at the big picture. You've got to think about how are these story elements and character elements functioning within the scope of that adaptation of their story, of this retelling itself, before you can even really safely compare. It's not enough just to say this detail of the story, Matt's dad in the show is different from Matt's dad in the books. Yes, that is perfectly true. But, and I mean this question carefully, so what? That is, what does that mean? So what? What, what is the effect of that change? And what, so before we can even really compare what they're doing with show Matt and what they're doing with book Matt, we need to answer those questions. We need to really think about what are they doing with show Matt, right? What effect, what are the so what's, right? What are the, what are the effects of these character changes that they make? And then once we get a clearer picture of what show Matt is doing, um, uh, what they're doing with show Matt, I should say, then we can compare. And I find when I do that, it works most of the time. It works. Um, and not only is it not bad, I find it to be actually very good. Very good. Um, so, um, okay. Um, what else? Other, other, other characters do you guys want to talk about? Other, other problems? Uh, that uh, that that folks had. I'm happy to talk about anything uh, from the show. Okay, let me address another thing. Uh, this is more thematic. Um, some people were objecting to the nudity. There was nudity in the show. Um, there was nudity, and several times, and people were saying this is totally unnecessary and egregious nudity. When was the last time you read the books? There's a lot of nudity in the books. I mean, a lot. People are naked all the time. Again, not all the time. That's an exaggeration. Frequently. People get naked frequently in the books. And guess why they do it? For no reason. <laughs> no, not for no reason. But, like, Robert Jordan is enormously fond of stripping his characters naked. Um, and often pe people are naked, uh, like for like non-essential <laughs> reasons, like, oh, there goes another naked person running around. Um, uh, yeah, so uh, Cyber Exile, seriously, reread the books. Um, nudity is used as a punishment very frequently, very frequently. Um, uh, it's used as a punishment 
like people, somebody is taken captive and stripped naked and made to and, and, and made to appear naked to humiliate them. That happens frequently, right? Nudity is used as a training mechanism when you are trying to keep an apprentice in line um, and you're wanting to keep them from getting above themselves or you're wanting to discipline them. It's a, it's it's a, it's also a it's a discipline thing. Um, Egwene and Avienda are naked in the Aiel camp when they're apprenticed to the wise ones all the time. Like they, they, they're they naked more often than they wear clothes, it seems sometimes, right? We're having a ceremony with the Aes Sedai, so everybody goes topless while we're uh, while we're voting for the new Amarlin, which happens twice. Um, the, I, like this, this, this happens all the time in the book. There's a lot of nudity in the books that is not like essential. There's a lot of egregious nudity in the books. Um, I, I like it's it's, <laughs> it's like it's 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 it I, now I'm not saying I loved this in the movies I didn't I, I I was not a fan of the nudity I would have done without all of it um um this is it's on my list of things that I personally disliked about that show um I don't like it but people who say like oh they went on their way to add all this nudity no they didn't they subtracted nudity in fact, I hope they don't continue trying to be true to the nudity in the books, because there's a whole lot of it. Um, uh, so anyway, I'm just saying um, that's um, that's that's I'm unsympathetic to people who feel like the books were violated by having nudity added. They were not. There's lots of nudity in the books. Um, now, I will agree that and I, I like this about Robert Jordan. Robert Jordan is not. um salacious, right? Um, there are not a lot of explicit sexual scenes. There are sexual scenes. There's not a lot of explicitly sexual scenes. And um, I think he handles both the sexual scenes and sort of the sexual desire and dynamics uh, within his stories. He handles it sort of gently and tastefully as a whole uh, and in most of the time, reasonably family-friendly ways. Um, but then again, the show didn't really violate that very significantly. Um, there are some sexual encounters, uh, but there, uh, I mean, there's not like, you know, long, unnecessary, topless sex scenes, you know, like they used to insert in almost every 80s movie, right? Like in Top Gun or Terminator or something like that, where there's like the what seems like the con contractually obligated topless sex scene, right? Um, it, it, it didn't strike me as as, as being like that. Um, so again, did I love that element of the show? No, I did not love that element of the show. Um, did I think it was untrue to the books? No, I, I think it's there in the books. Um I think how many baths people take? How many scenes involve people in bathtubs? This was one of the one, the, the well, there were two nudity scenes uh, that I'm recalling in the show. One was actually a getting into the bathtub scene, and the other was in a steam bath scene. Both of which, by the way, are all over the books. People are in bathtubs and in steam baths very frequently, and they're always naked when they are. So again, they were those are those are things in the book. Those happen in the book. Um, and uh, I are so I'm just saying, like, um, there was plenty. If they, I don't love their choice to say we want to go out of our way to add this into the show, but given that they didn't mind doing that or wanted to do that, the books give them plenty of warrant for doing that. So anyway, just, I have to, uh, it's, it's a complaint that I, I, it's a complaint. Again, I understand and have no problem with people disliking it. I disliked it too. Um, but I also kind of dislike the egregious nudity in the books. It's one of my least favorite elements of the books. Um, and whenever a character strips down and is naked in public again uh, in the books, I'm like, seriously, Robert, again? Like, we have to go there? Um, but uh, but there we are. Um, okay, Brett, let's talk about that. Um, uh, Nynaeve bringing people back from the dead in general being stronger than her book counterpart. Um, uh, okay, Um Disagree. First of all, she didn't bring people back from the dead. Um, uh, the only person that she heals 
um, is uh, so Lan is mortally wounded, like he's bleeding out from a, an arterial bleed from you know his his uh, his carotid artery is severed and he's rapidly bleeding out. Um, but I did not get the impression he wasn't dead. Like she doesn't come and find his corpse and resuscitate him. He is on the edge of dying. Um, and the implication certainly is that nobody else could have revived him. But in fact, there's a dead Aes Sedai in the room at the time who is not revived by the like massive hewing burst, right? That uh, Nynaeve in the, in that show Nynaeve uh, pushes forward, right? So I don't, I don't think they crossed that line at all with Nynaeve. Um, they did go out of their way to show her performing an act that the other, that made the other Aes Sedai say, holy crap, <laughs> That's amazing, right? She's incredibly powerful, which was the point. And Nynaeve is, right? Um, remember the metaphor that Moiraine uses in the book, in book one, um, in The Eye of the World, is that um, Egwene is so strong in the power that she would be one of the strongest candidates, right? One of the strongest novices. If she goes to the tower, she'll be one of the strongest novices uh, that the Aes Sedai have seen in generations. But her power is like a candle besides the ra beside the raging bonfire that is Nynaeve's power, right? That's the metaphor that Moiraine uses to try to capture exactly how powerful Nynaeve, Nynaeve is. The thing that keeps getting repeated is that Nynaeve is the most powerful Aes Sedai in a thousand years, right? Um, she is as powerful. She, on more than one occasion, takes on one of the forsaken toe-to-toe -to -toe and, and equals her, right? So, yes, she is supposed to be extraordinarily head, shoulders, and torso more powerful than anybody else has ever heard of. That's in the books, right? That's in the books. So the way that they conveyed that, again... They conveyed that efficiently through that one scene. Lan is bleeding out, right? In 30 seconds of screen time, they did several different things. They did um, look at Nynaeve's power. The unprecedented sort of... She accomplished things that, that the other Aes Sedai thought were impossible to accomplish, right? Nobody else would have, could have healed Lan, who is that far gone already. Not to mention that, but like as a side effect, P.S. She healed everybody else in the room, right? Now that kind of thing doesn't happen in the books. Nynaeve has to individually heal every individual person that she wants to heal. That, so that was a change from the books. That like this burst of power was so is so amazing that it heals everybody in the room. That's a change, but what it accomplished was very much to convey something that was conveyed in the books. That they, Again, they manage in 30 seconds to give you the clear impression Nynaeve is not only um, just unusually powerful, right? Um, she is something unprecedented in, like, remembered Aes Sedai history. Um, and... I thought that was really effective, how they accomplished that. Of course, as a bonus, they also, at the same time, accomplished, oh, and Nynaeve is falling in love with Lan, right? Um, you know, that's the moment when her uh, uh, affection for Lan becomes known to herself, to others, um, where it had uh, only just been sort of beginning to grow uh, to that point. So, again... They were totally multitasking that scene like crazy, and I thought that that worked really, really well. Um, so I don't think they actually, in my opinion, Brett, I, I don't see them departing uh, from the the sort of scope of Nynaeve's character um, or from the kind of the basic facts of how they handle the power and all those uh, kinds of things. Right, Brett says, yeah, you think maybe it's too much too fast. Oh, look, I totally get that. And again... Compared to the pace of the book, everything in the show is going to be too much too fast, right? Um, yeah, um, but uh, but yeah, I mean, they, I mean, they, like, how can they not, right? How could they possibly not? Um, yeah, um, and I agree. Um, yes, so Brett, one of the things you're talking about how uh, Nynaeve um, um, sucks with the power unless she's angry for four books or so. Actually, it's like eight books or so, isn't it? She finally b breaks her block. Um, it's a long time. At least book seven. Uh, maybe book eight. Um, so yeah, she she not only sucks with the power, she can't do it at all. So she can't channel unless she's angry. She has this, uh, she, she has a, she has a, like a, a psychological block, right? She cannot channel the one power unless she's angry um, in the book. Um, 
And I'm going to be really interested, Brett, to see um, if um, uh, if they if they if they do that. That's not obvious yet. She doesn't channel much. Nynaeve doesn't channel often. Right. Um, and uh, it's not clear to me that they're not going to do that, actually. Um, or maybe she's going to develop the block as a result of what happens to her in episode eight of season one. I don't know. Um, but um, but it, it's as yet to me an open question as to whether or not the show is going to attempt to do Nynaeve's block uh, to the power. Um, they might, they might not. It's not been an issue yet. But remember, it's not an issue yet with her at the beginning either, because she's still kind of in denial and not really wanting to be an Aes Sedai at all. So she doesn't even really try to tra to channel um, for quite some time. It's um, not until book two, when she's finally headed towards the tower, that she starts to take lessons, and that's when her block really becomes an issue, right? Like in the lessons that she gets from Swan Sanche on the way back to Tarvalin um, uh, in, uh, in book two. So anyway, so we'll see. But I guess so I, I didn't find that a big departure. I loved Nynaeve's character. I, 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 she was another character that I really, really liked. Um, if um, I'm trying to think, are there characters? I know I sound, I'm sounding like a broken record because um, I really thought their adaptation was very, very smart. Are there any characters whose uh, sort of trajectory, trajectories I didn't like? Um, I think, Brett. I think I had a reaction to Lan, in the in the show to show Lan, kind of like what you're describing in your reaction to show Nynaeve. Too much, too fast, right? And again, I can't criticize it, but Lan is, um, you know, by episode two, right, one or two, I was already like, man, Lan has a lot of lines, <laughs> right? I mean, Lan doesn't talk much. Right. And, and he's funny for not talking much. I loved Matt's joke about that, by the way, when he gives the speech about Shadar Logoth and Matt says, OK, that's first of all, that's the most words you've said all day, perhaps ever. Right. So, I mean, it's funny. I mean, they made a joke out of it. But Matt's joke would have been funnier in the book because um, show Lan actually talks a lot more than uh, book Lan talks. Um, I get again, like they're kind of progressing his character in an accelerated way. His character does develop over the course of the book. Um, I didn't really feel that the direction that his character was going was antipathetic to the direction that his character was developing in the book. Um, but it, it was fast. So I kind of, um, in the book, I really kind of enjoy uh, silent, brusque Lan. And um, uh, and it, it, because of the long, slow boil of character development in the books, it made, for me, the really cool jump is the very beginning of um, the, the Great Hunt, book two of the series, when um, Lan is training Rand in sword fighting um, and then brings him before uh, the Amarlin seat. Uh, uh, and um, it kind of like prompts him to, uh, you know, cheek the Aes Sedai. And, and uh, um, it's the first time Lan does, like, much of his own initiative, right? Um, where we really can begin to see that there's a, there's a, there's, there's a gap there, right? Um, he's not 100% in step, either with the Aes Sedai in general or even with Moraine in, pers in, partic in particular. Um, he doesn't always see eye to eye to, uh, with her on everything. They accelerated that a great deal. And so therefore I lost that moment, right? Where, you know, Lan is this stoical, unspeaking character uh, through and um, uh, whom we know very little about. Uh, and then we get to know him a little bit. So th the effect of that was lost because we don't get the kind of slow burn. It was much more, much faster, Brett, as you're saying about Nynaeve. Um, but again, I think that that was inevitable. And I will say, although I missed... I lost that element of Land's character development. I found that I gained something. Um, and what I gained was uh, believability of Nynaeve falling in love with him, right? Um, I am always conscious of suspending disbelief when Nynaeve falls in love with Lan. Um, I'm good at it, suspending disbelief. I've got skills. I can I can suspend disbelief uh, with the best of them. But when I am aware that I am doing it, when I'm aware that I am 
consciously suspending disbelief, that always strikes me as a weakness in the story. Um, uh, you know, the as Tolkien says in On Fairy Stories, if disbelief must be consciously suspended, the art has failed at that moment. Um, and, that, and, and, and that's what I find. T to me, that's a blemish of the eye of the world, is that I don't, I don't have secondary belief in Nynaeve's love for Lan. I'm willing to take it um, and run with it, um, but I don't really believe in it. Um, I don't have any reason. I don't feel like I have much reason to believe in it. What does she see in him? When did she see it? Right. Um, she seems to be in love with him almost right away. And um, and he's done nothing to justify it other than be, um, you know, uh, silent, dark and handsome and dangerous. Maybe that's enough, but it wasn't enough for me. Um, but um, anyway, it's it's. Uh, I'm not saying he does nothing to do it, but it's 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 not quite enough for me. Whereas in the in the show, I, I believed in it much more, um, because they do more with his character right away. They have him talk more, and because we see the gap between him and and Moraine and the Aes Sedai more and more quickly, um, then it it really contributed to my. I found the relationship both directions between Nynaeve and Lan. I have to admit, I believe in Lan's love for Ny his reciprocation of Nynaeve's love for him even less in the book. I got I have to suspend disbelief even harder, um, and I'm happy to do it. Um, but I but I am suspending in both cases. The, I thought the romance between Nynaeve and Lan in the show was was much more compelling. I I, I believed in it. Um, let me get back to the big uh, thing though. That the one thing that I think is is st strikes me as most different: the gender issue. Um, Again, okay, so in the book, um, Moraine is uncertain. She believes, she s strongly suspects that, uh, which, you know, she knows that the dragon has been reborn because there was a foretelling, right? Um, she and Swan Sanche heard this elderly Aes Sedai, um, and again, this gets alluded to in the show. They didn't totally change that. Um, uh, they... Um, uh, anyway, so she like says she has a foretelling and says the dragon has been reborn this day, right? Um, so they know the dragon has been reborn and they're trying to find him, right? Um, that story is the same in the book and the show. In the book, Moraine is almost positive that it's one of those th one of the three boys. It's either Rand, Matt, or Perrin, and neither she nor the Dark One know which one it is. Right, which of the three, and that's one of the subplots of book one is the, you know, Dark One's trying to off all three of them, right? Um, uh, and neither he nor Ishamael, who is the dude uh, with the glowing uh, fire eyes who appears in their dreams, um, neither of them uh, know which one of them is actually the Dragon Reborn. Um, so in the show, the difference that they introduce is that. Um, it is apparently a theoretical possibility that the dragon could re be reborn either as a male or a female. Um, in the book, that's never true. Like, it's definitely a man. Um, the only question is, which boy is the dragon reborn? In the show, they, they choose to let it be either one. Like, it could be either one. Which means it's not just about the three boys. It's about the three boys and Egwene. Oh, and sort of Nynaeve, right? Uh, Nynaeve is a candidate too, so it's the five of them instead of just the three of them. Now, um, that's a major change. It's a huge change. I, again, in my opinion, it's the biggest change they made. Um, of all of the alterations that they made to the book story, that is the most daring of all of the changes that they made. Um, I've heard people talk about they changed how the one power works. I don't agree. I don't see any evidence of that. I think that their handling of how the One Power works um, seemed to me to be quite consistent with the book. Um, when I was watching the show the second time, I couldn't help but wonder, is the objection that people had that they were objecting to what Leandrin, the Leandrin character, says in episode one? Right when she's like um, talking to, um, you know, this is when she's capturing. Uh, I think it's Owen. I think it's uh, it's actually possibly. I think it's actually meant to be 
uh, Tom Marilyn's nephew. Um, but anyway, um, uh, okay. Sorry, in season one. Sorry, I apologize, Brad. Thank you for. Uh, I, I I often misspeak like that. Okay, so no, when in episode one, um, she corners this man who can channel, right? And she makes this speech about the one power and what it is and how it works. And she's like, oh, it is, the one power is only for women and not for it is not appropriate ever for men to use it." Um, she makes this speech, which sounds very different from. Um, uh, very different from the way that uh, the one power is depicted in the books. So I couldn't help but wonder, I'm like, are people just listening to, are, are you believing Leandrin? Right? Leandrin is not a reliable source. First of all, she's read Aja. Of course she thinks that about the male half of the source. That's like part of her creed, right? That doesn't mean it's true. It's not true. I don't believe a word that Leandrin says about the one power, right? Um, I don't think we're supposed to believe a word that Leandrin says about the one power. That is not a speech that is supposed to tell us as viewers, here's how the one power works. Um, that's a, a, a speech that's designed to tell us, here's what the Red Aja is all about, right? And why, uh, and what you should associate, what sort of views you should associate uh, with the one power, or, sorry, with the Red Aja down the road. And not only that, but... Okay, I said I'm not going to worry about spoilers. In the book, Leandrin is a dark friend. She's Black Aja, in fact. She's serving the Dark One. She's evil, right? She's lying. I mean, it's just, it's, it's like, seriously? Like, and, but other than that, if you take out that speech from Leandrin, what is said about the One Power or its history or its usage, which is totally not in keeping with what's described in the book. I don't get it. I just, I just don't, I'm just confused. I don't even really know what people are referring to because it all seemed to me to make, um, to make a lot of, to make a lot of sense. Um, but okay, back to the, um, back to the reincarnation thing. Reincarnation, of course, major thing in the Wheel of Time. Um, uh, people are, you know, people get, will be reborn uh, lots of times. Um, I do not believe in the books. Sorry, sorry. This is the face I make when I'm trying to scan through like 14,000 pages of text in my head. I cannot think offhand of any examples in the book when we are told that a person is reborn cross-gender. I don't think that that's a thing in the books. That's why, as I said, I think that that change was the most daring change that they made in the show. Um, I don't think, I don't think there's a single example of that. Um, Brigida and um, uh, Gato Kane are a good example. Um, they're always, they never swap or anything, right? They're always, um, they always come back as, she always comes back as a girl, he always comes back as a boy. Um, uh yeah, I can't think... Matt doesn't have any memories of former lives as women. Um, he's always been a man in every life. He gets memories of his previous lives, and um, they... Or at least he gets memories. It's implied they're of his previous lives. Um, it's a chance they're not, but uh, they're just other random people's memories. But um, the implication seems to be that they're his previous lives, I think. Um, anyway, I... So, yeah, I can't think of any examples of that. So, in Robert Jordan's world-building... That appears to not be a thing. So they have made the choice. First and foremost, they made the choice to say, we're going to change that. We're going to say that cross-gender reincarnation is a possibility, right? Okay. Now, so that I, I see a change. What do I do? I step back and say, what's the effect of that change? What's the impact of that change? Um, and... I don't yet know fully what the impact is. Um, one impact, of course, is to facilitate a more flexible view of gender uh, in this world. Um, but I don't see that as... It doesn't strike me as an enormously impactful decision. At least, I will say, in, in season one of the show so far, I have not seen it impact the story in any very significant ways. Um, it has never been plot important that somebody came back as a cross 
you know, it's a, a different a different gender than they were the last time in their previous life. Um, so I have not yet seen that have an impact apart from the one big question at the beginning um, about who's the Dragon Reborn. And the obviously the only significant plot impact of the potential for cross-gender reincarnation is that it widens the pool, right? So now of like, it's not just the three of them. It could be any of the four. Um, Moraine knows full well that um, Nynaeve can't really be a candidate. She's too old. She's too old. She was born five years before. They know the time at which the, the dragon was reborn. That was part of the prophecy. Like on this day, the dragon has been reborn. And that's still true in the show. Moraine knows that Nynaeve, in the show, show Moraine knows that show Nynaeve is five years too old uh, to be the dragon reborn. She still is kind of, uh, Nynaeve is such a marvel that she's like, let me not rule it out too precipitously. Maybe there's something weird, funky going on that I, we don't understand. Maybe she's not as old as she thinks she is. Maybe there was some mystery about her birth and, and whatever. So she kind of keeps that possibility open, but even she doesn't really believe it. The real candidates are the four, right? The three boys, which, who are the candidates in the book, and Egwene. So, functionally, how is the story different for permitting cross-gender reincarnation? And the answer is Egwene gets included. It's now not a story about the three boys. It's now a story about the four kids, including Egwene, right? Okay, why? What's the effect of that? What are the consequences of that uh, what, what what are kind of the repercussions throughout the story? And when I stopped and look at that, I say, actually, that mere fact, the fact that Egwene's character, Egwene's significance basically gets elevated, um, works for me. In fact, it seems to me, this is going to sound like a funny thing to say, but it seems to me almost truer to the book story than the first book is. Let me explain what I mean by that. By the time we get to book seven, eight, certainly, absolutely, by the time we get to book nine, 10, 11, 12, Egwene's character is enormous. Like she is one of the great, most important characters in the entire world, right? Um, Her character grows enormously. She's this kind of tag-along at the beginning in Eye of the World. It is not at all obvious what role she is to play in the Eye of the World. Now, I'm not saying Robert Jordan had no clue. I'm saying in the book, The Eye of the World, there is no... She's tagging along. She's like Rand's love interest. She is the person that... Um, Parent is concerned about. I'm not saying she's not a good character. I'm not saying he's not developing her as a character. He is. Um... But it is not obvious from if you just read the Eye of the World and nothing else, it is not obvious what the point of Egwene's character is. Why is she there? What's important about her? Okay, so she can become Aes Sedai. Oh, so she'll be a pretty powerful Aes Sedai, uh, apparently. Um, but not so powerful as nothing like so powerful as Nynaeve. Um, what's her job? What's her role? Nynaeve at least goes on to like fall and have a love interest with Lan. That's something, right? Um, which connects her in in some other interesting ways. Um, what's the point of her? In book one, it's not clear what the point of her is. Now, again, Jordan gets there. By the end, it's clear. When you look back in retrospect, when you're sitting in like book 12 or 13 and you look back towards book one, the story does become, wow, man, th these four kids all grew up in the same village? Not only Rand, the dragon reborn, um, and Matt, who becomes the, like the greatest general ever, and Perrin, um, who's awesome in lots of other ways and like, you know, uh, uh, you know, Mr. Uh, uh, dances with wolves. Um, but Egwene becomes, I mean, she becomes second only to Rand, right? I mean, she becomes a greater and more powerful and more important character, like for global history, than either, really either Matt or Perrin, even though both of them are very important, right? Um, but she's sort of left out. She's, she's not part of the set, right? Think about the way in which Rand and Matt and Perrin are tied together um, by the wheel, Right from the beginning, there are the three of them are Taviran. She's not Taviran, right? She's totally a second class citizen in book one, right? They're Taviran. She's not Taviran. They're bound together by the wheel. She's an extra, right? By the end, um, she's not Taviran in the book. She's never Taviran in the book. 
but doesn't it kind of feel by the end like she kind of acts like one, right? Like if you weren't told that she weren't, you might think she was, right? Um, he kind of treats her that way. In my mind, again, it, it's I, I liked this set of four. Um, honestly, it felt to me like a bit of gender-based discrimination on Robert Jordan's part at the beginning. Um, I don't think he took Egwene's character as seriously at the beginning. My conclusion, from what I look at, it doesn't seem to me, the story does not seem to take her character as seriously at the beginning. It grows. That changes over the course of the series. But from the perspective of the end of the book series, looking back at the beginning, I could wish that it were handled differently. And so when I look at the effect of the cross-gender reincarnation potential, right, uh, in, the, in the show, whose effect is to put Egwene on an equal footing with the three boys, right? So that we do, from the very beginning, we have these four kind of five characters, right? Again, Nynaeve is always kind of in a separate category, but it's focusing on the four. We have these four young people, all the same age, who all grew up in the same village, this podunk mountain village, right, from the middle of nowhere. And the four of them are going to go off and they're going to shake the world, right? And the four of them are going to be primarily responsible uh, for, you know, saving the world from the Dark One by the end of the series, right? That's the, that's the truth. That's what happens in the books, right? But that's not how it's set up at the beginning of the book story. The show sets it up that way from the very beginning by putting all four of them on equal footing. The, saying all four of them are Tavirin, which again feels to me right, actually. I feel like in retrospect, uh, Egwene should have been Tavirin all along. Um, um, so having it be about the four of them instead of the three boys plus the female sidekick, right? I like that change. I like that change a lot. Again, not only do I just kind of enjoy it more, but I also think, as I say, it's truer to where the books end up than book one of the series is true to where the books end up. Now, last thing, and then I'll stop because I'm running out of time. Um, back to the concerns that people had about like, well, obviously Dragon Reborn must be a male channeler, right? Yes, I think so, right? Um, but again, I ask you to say, step back a minute. Are they? Is the, does the show suggest that it's unaware of the fact that the madness of male channelers and the importance of cleaning the taint from the, you know, like the taint on the male half of the source, that that's not an issue in the show? That they're unaware of that and the fact that that's important and that that led to the cracking of the world and everything in the, the sort of post-apocalyptic post world uh, that this thing is, uh, that this whole uh, story is set in? No, of course, the show is very clear about those things, right? So it's not fudging the male half of the power. Um, how they treat Saiyadeen, I think, is really interesting. I kind of love the visual representation of the power um, and the visual representation of the taint, that that like oily black power that weaves in and around uh, Saiyadeen when, a male, when uh, like Loghain is using it. Super cool, I think. Um, I really like that. Um, a little bit cheesy in some places. It's hard to make effects like that work all the time, but I, in general, I really liked it. Um, and, uh, okay. So, so again, I say, stop, back up and ask the why questions, right? What is the, why, why did they make this change? What is the effect of this change? That's better than the why question. What's the effect? What is the effect of this change that they make? What is the effect of saying that the dragon might possibly have been reborn as a, as a woman, right? If that's a possibility, what it does is it distinguishes. There, there are two elements. Rand is the dragon reborn. We know this by the end of the series. We learn this by the end of the first book, right? Rand is the dragon reborn. What does that mean? What does it mean to be the dragon reborn? In the books, what does it mean to be the dragon reborn? Well, it means several different things, doesn't it? It does mean that you are a male channeler of the source, right? Um, and therefore likely to go mad as the original dragon did go mad and break the world and therefore possibly break the world again. Right. So the fact that part of the mantle of Dragon Reborn is powerful male channeler who may break the world again. 
right? Um, like, uh, he's definitely not a tame lion, right? The dragon reborn. Not a tame dragon, right? Um, uh, and there's lots of reason to think that uh, he's a, he's bad news and is going to destroy everybody. So, yes, that's definitely an element, um, an important element in the story. But but there are lots of male Chanoars. There are several male Chanoars. And Rand is very strong. He's a very powerful male Chanoar. But there are other very powerful male, male Chanoars also, Right? Uh, he's stronger than they are, but still, um, that's just a matter of degree. He might be three or four times as powerful as some of the other ones. He might be a hundred times as powerful as some of, as some other male channelers in the story. Um, but that's just a, that's not a that's not an absolute thing. That's there. He the dragon is sort of the most important figurehead of a category of people. That is males who can channel, right? And that story, the story of males who can channel in the male half of the source, is a very important element of the entire Wheel of Time story and a very important element of the character of the Dragon Reborn, but it's not the only element of that character, right? The Dragon Reborn is more than just um, a male channeler who's really powerful and might go mad and break the world again. The Dragon Reborn, there's something else. There's something about being the Dragon Reborn, right? Um, and this, to me, was the most significant effect of the cross-gender possibility, right? The fact that the show opened the potential, they raised the open question that maybe the dragon could be reborn as a girl, right? What that immediately forced me to do is to say, huh, what would that look like? How could that be? What would happen? What would happen if the dragon were reborn as a woman? Well, he'd probably be a channeler, but obviously there wouldn't be the madness question. In other words, what it did was, um, but it would mean something. It would still mean something. And so when I kind of cast my imagination in that direction, I was like, okay, it would, um, it would mean something. Yeah, Autoflagellator says the Dragon Reborn is simultaneously a messiah and an antichrist. That's a really good characterization of it, actually. That messianic element of the Dragon Reborn, right? That the Dragon Reborn is the Messiah figure, but also, as you say, potentially the Antichrist, right? Um, uh, that messianic element of the Dragon Reborn gets distilled by the choice to say it could be a woman, right? If it were a woman, then you would have all of the messianic significance of the Dragon Reborn without the male channeler element of the character of the Dragon Reborn. It, it's almost, it would be like a, like a sort of laboratory experiment where you kind of take these two different elements of what it means in the book to be the Dragon Reborn and you distill them right into two separate places. And I found that a really interesting thought experiment, right? And it was the messianic significance, autoflagellator, of the Dragon Reborn that I found that choice for me ended up really emphasizing. It really brought home the fact it isn't just that the Dragon Reborn is a male channeler, or the greatest and most powerful male channeler. There's, it's like something else. And what is that? What does that mean? What is the messianic role and mantle, to use that word again, of the Dragon Reborn? And I found that really interesting. Now, keep in mind, a lot of people say, like, oh, that's a huge change. On the one hand, I, I agree. I think it's a very daring change, the biggest, most daring change that they made. But on the other hand, it's not. The Dragon Reborn turns out not, in fact, to be a woman, right? Um, the only change they made was the possibility, the theoretical possibility that maybe it's a woman. They didn't actually make that change. Had they done it, had they followed through, and said, actually, yeah, turns out Egwene is the Dragon Reborn. Then I would have been like, okay, that's fascinating, but we are now telling a different story. Like, this is not the same story anymore, right? I, I would have had a really hard time with that at that point. Just, I mean, not that I, maybe I would have liked it. Maybe it would have been really interesting, um, but they didn't do that. They, in fact, Brand is still the Dragon Reborn. It's fine. They, in fact, kept the Messianic element and the male channeler element. They kept them combined in the Dragon Reborn, and we'll see them working out together in Rand's character in season two and, and forward, I presume, 
right? Um, so they didn't. Act, so at the end of the day, they didn't even make any changes. On the one hand, it's a really gutsy change. On the other hand, it's no change at all. The story is in fact the same, right? So why do it? Why introduce that possibility? Well, again, when I ask why and when I look at it and say, what is the effect of that? To me, the primary effect is the elevation of the status of Egwene's character, it putting the putting of Egwene on equal footing with the three boys. And at the end of the day, I quite liked that effect. I thought that that effect worked really well in general and was really true uh, to the story that eventually Robert Jordan gets around to writing. Um but, um, yeah, yeah, um, yeah, so, um, so anyway, so that's, that's my, that's my analysis of that bit. Um, I can't believe, I haven't heard anybody complaining about the second biggest change that they made, the second gutsiest change that they made, um, which is what happens to Moraine at the end. The fact that Moraine gets stilled. In the final episode, there I was like, whoa, okay, that is huge, right? Um, and there, I'm, of course, <clears throat> it happens at the end of the last episode, right? So I don't know what they're doing with that. It's really hard for me to judge the effect of that choice, right? But I will tell you something. I'm really interested in it, right? Um, we know they're going to have to compress lots of stuff, right? Um one of the things when you take a really, really long story and you're trying to do it more efficiently, um, there are several things. There, there, there are things that you have to do. And one of the things that you have to do is make scenes, incidents, and characters do multiple jobs, right? You either cut those things or you, you have to add them in. To other places. Like I said, when, when I was doing the random mat on the road to Camelot analysis, right, they took that one incident in the mining village and they made it do a whole bunch of jobs, right? And I thought they did those jobs really effectively. By the way, they also introduced the Aiel for a bonus, right, in that sequence as well. Anyway, so like they, 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 they make it do lots of jobs. It's not, that incident is not doing, um, it's not, it's doing more jobs. It did all of the jobs that the parallel incident a parallel incident stretch of the, you know, you know, like a series of chapters in the original book did. It did all the jobs that, the, that those series did and it did others as well. And that's what you have to do in order to tell, uh, in order to tell the story, um, more directly. So absolutely. Of course, Moraine was never stilled. That doesn't happen in the books, but there are several people who are right. And, you have to give, so story jobs. Jobs is the metaphor I like to use. Like what jobs does a character have? What, what jobs does a scene do? What are you trying to convey? What are you trying to accomplish? Um, what work is being done? Narrative work is being done by a particular character, by a particular scene. Um, you can talk about, you can think this way when you're reading books. You can think this way when you're looking at, um, at you know, movies or shows. And I find it a really useful way to think about adaptations. So, um, uh, Okay, um, so they, I don't know what job uh, Moraine's stilling at the end of season one is going gonna, is gonna to do, because I don't know where they're going to go with that. Um, but here's my guess. This is me speculating about the show. My speculation is that they are going to think about Swan Sanchez's role, right? The character trajectory of Swan Sanche in the book, right? In particular with her stilling and her eventual healing from being stilled, right? Um, which had never happened before, this part of Nynaeve's character progression, right? Um, and what it means about her, like, having to come to uh, uh, cope with her changed role and all that kind of thing, right? Um, uh Nynaeve needs somebody stilled to heal, right? That subplot and storyline of very powerful Aes Sedai woman who loses her position, gets stilled, and has to be healed, and then uh, cope with handling things in different ways. My suspicion is that that's the trajectory that they're going to take Moraine on. That. They're, so they're going to make sure her character is going to do that job, basically. Um, I think that. Um, what's going to my suspicion about what they're based on what I'm seeing, what I expect to happen 
Um, and think about in books two through four, the relationship, the progression of Moraine's relationship with Rand, right? His increasing distrust, her attempts to win him over and become his advisor, right? The, the trajectory of Moraine and Rand's relationship from the end of the Eye of the World through the initial conclusion of Moraine's character, right? Um, when she goes through the doorway. Um, that trajectory of her character, I expect season two of the show will deal, like that drama, the drama of Moraine and Rand's relationship, um, that trajectory is my guess as to what season two is going to be in. And if they, I can easily see how they could combine that with also introducing through Moraine the um, uh, the this like the Swan Sanche trajectory, right? Where really powerful acid I gets stilled, gets healed, but still has to learn to cope with it uh, and do things in different ways. Um, but um, anyway, so I can imagine. If I were writing this show, I can think of some ways in which those two subplots could be really interestingly combined in ways that I think might be really compelling for Moraine's character in the way that Moraine's character is kind of static in the books, right? And I think that they, um, I, it's a bold move, but I I think it could work. I don't know how they're going to do it. Maybe what they do is not going to end up being very interesting, but I can see some potential really interesting things coming from that. So... I'm still kind of in a wait and see. Obviously, it happened at the very end of the last episode, so I'm in, I'm in, I'm in wait and see mode about the stilling of Moraine to see how that's going to pan out and what they're going to do with it. Um, can't judge it yet. But I can definitely see some interesting potential, and that's what I'm hoping to see in season two, uh, to see how all that stuff kind of uh, works um, works in there together. So, so, yeah, we'll see. I think that there's a lot of potential there. So, I mean, in general, again, I, I thought... I feel like the Wheel of Time show is getting horribly, horribly mistreated um, by, I think, mostly professional haters. Um, I totally understand Robert Jordan fans who are reeling at differences. Like, I get that. I again, I totally get that. But when I sit down and I think through it, when I was watching this show a second time, I've just, I'm just finishing. I'm like in, um, uh, I'm in Towers of what's it called? Towers of Twilight. I these are one, some of those books that I'm reading so often that I, uh, uh, or reading for so long, rather, that I, like, lose sight of their titles. What's this book called again? Towers of Midnight. That's it. Not Twilight. Midnight. Towers of Midnight. I'm about uh, three quarters of the way through Towers of Midnight, which is the second last book. Um, so I've been, I've just been rereading the whole series again. I've just watched the series twice. The more I think about it and the more I analyze it, the more I admire uh, the Wheel of Time adaptation. I think it's brilliant. I thought it was visually gorgeous. Um, uh, really interesting and really sensitive. Um, and, um, um, yeah, let's see, uh, uh, Findeladon, um, I like Matt's character. Now, I don't like where Matt's character ended up in this. I mean, like, I, that is, I'm not, a, I'm not, like, cheering for where Matt's character ended up, but my suspicion there, they're, they're, they're dealing with Matt's, they're doing, they have to do, they're ex everything's accelerated in the show, right? So they're doing an accelerated version of his corruption with the dagger. Um, and it's going to take him a while. Like he's not been, he's not, he's been initially cured, but, but it's still, there's still a problem with the dagger, right? So, um, uh, so we'll see, we'll see what happens with, um, uh, with Matt's character towards the end, um, where they go with Matt's character. But I, I don't, I definitely don't see them wandering off in a random direction with Matt's character. Um, as I say, I think it, I think it works really well, but all right. I gotta go. I'm late. Uh, uh, thanks for your patience. This was a really fun discussion. I've been, I've been looking forward to, uh, doing some serious Robert Jordan and wheel of time adaptation geeking out for a long time. Um, I hope that that was helpful at the very least, even if you, I mean, you don't have to agree with my assessment, of course, and you certainly don't have to like it if you don't like it. Um, but what I am hoping the kind of analysis that I'm trying to do here, the kinds of questions that I'm asking and the ways that I go about answering them, I hope that this kind of helped. This is how I made my way back from being uh, 
a purist who just like responded emotionally and kept saying, that's wrong. They got that wrong. They got that wrong. Like I used to do that all the time when I was watching adaptations. Um, this is what kind of pulled me out of that and helped me to really enjoy adaptations and to get some real joy and not only a enjoyment of the adaptations themselves, but to have every single time I watch and think about an adaptation, even a horrible adaptation, it greatly augments my appreciation of the original work. Not only did I not lose Robert Jordan uh, by watching that show, I gained appreciation for Robert Jordan and understanding of the story because of being forced to do this kind of close comparison. So anyway, I hope that that was interesting and helpful. Um, and we'll see next week. We've got some special guests uh, next week. So we've got a, a couple of uh, our new friends uh, from TikTok who are coming to join us. We'll talk a little bit about uh, the world of uh, Tolkien TikTokery, which is a fascinating world, which I've been uh, exploring a bit myself recently, which is fun. Um, and uh, we'll talk about some more issues. I think next week we might have uh, some more stuff to talk about Um I, they've been teasing that Empire article, but I don't think it's actually going to get dropped uh, until after next week's episode. But we'll see. Anyway, we'll, we'll uh, talk about some uh, more stuff next week. Thanks, everybody. See you guys later. Uh, you can join me later tonight for our next discussion of Alice in Wonderland. We're doing Alice in Wonderland. Uh, talking about some more Lewis Carroll poetry tonight. Really excited. You can join me for that at 10 p.m. See you guys. Bye now. <laughs>